Hey everyone, this is Baphometrics, and today I'm taking a break from my usual Bitwig videos to talk about a new plugin called XO by XLN Audio. Uh, this is a really amazing, really amazing drum sample librarian and drum pattern editor. Uh, if you haven't heard of it yet, you really need to check this out. Uh, it's kind of in the same ballpark as Atlas. Um, by Algonaut, which I used to use heavily since it came out. Um, but I'm really liking XO, and I'm going to walk through a lot of the things I like about XO uh, and help you understand why this can really speed up your ability to find the right drum samples and uh, make drum patterns quickly and sort of organize a library of them and do some really interesting things. Now, there have been a few people who have made videos about EXO already, done the general walkthrough and showing you how features work. I'm not going to do that. If you want to see the big picture of how EXO works, go watch those other videos. I'm going to be talking about some things that they didn't cover in those other videos, and I really wish they would have because it would have helped me decide about this faster. So I'm going to show you some nitty gritty, detailed, deep dive tricks and tips and, and concepts about this thing that I haven't seen anyone else do in a video at the time that I made this one. And I'm doing this kind of for the benefit of my fellow ninjas and producer Dojo. I work with a lot of other producers, uh, dance-oriented, heavy bass music producers, where uh, being able to play with a lot of wild drum sounds uh, is pretty important. Uh, so you can come along for the ride, and uh, I'm talking to some fairly advanced producers, but uh, I think you'll learn some interesting things about this plugin, and maybe it'll tempt you to consider it despite the fairly hefty price tag on it. Um, so let's just start out really briefly, if you haven't seen this before. Uh, I'm going to play from these two MIDI clips that you see up top. I'm not playing internally from EXO. I'm using EXO passively as a drum machine right now. So I've got a couple kicks, snare clap, hi-hat, and kind of a shaker and another kind of percussive thing that's, uh, yeah, percussive thing. So it's just going to play a few of the sounds from this pattern here, just briefly to show that uh, I'm driving it with a MIDI clip. I'm not driving it internally. And I'm going to sync it to the host tempo. And uh, when I play the MIDI clip, it's just a passive drum machine. Okay, there's nothing really exciting there. Um, so that's the basic. You can use it passively as a drum machine with eight pads in it effectively. I personally like, some of you may go, oh, but no, you should. You need at least 16 pads for a drum machine. Yeah, think about how often you really use all 16 pads. Most of the time, especially in electronic dance music, you got a couple kicks, a couple snares, some you know, high frequency sounds like shakers and hi-hats, maybe one or two odd sounds, and that's the meat of your drum track. You really don't need more than eight pads to do the meat and potatoes of your drum track, right? Spicy sounds that you add to fill in the gaps in the drum groove, those are usually on a different track, a different drum machine entirely, or a different sampler entirely, or just a bunch of manual samples you drag out and arrange in your timeline manually. The meat of the drums is usually eight or less, so don't let the fact that this has only eight channels scare you. If anything, that makes it easier. Uh, a problem with even tools like Atlas is, you know, they have these four by four 16 pad grids and you load them all up with drum samples and most of the time half, you know, those samples are unused because you're only using five of them or six of them or seven of them. So bear that in mind. This is actually a benefit. It keeps things simple. I also like that it kind of forces you into thinking about the most common things you need for a meat and potatoes beat. You can't change this to say something other than kick one. You can't change this to say something other than kick two. Now you can load any kind of sample you want in here. I could be loading hi-hats into these kick slots, but the fact that it's named in this way forces you to kind of like, okay, I need these elements. I need at least a kick, one kick. I need a snare. Maybe I need a clap as an alternate type of snare. I could load a rim shot into this clap or something, right? So you basically have two kick slots, two clap slots, which are very common. 
very useful. And then you have your standard kind of uh, two high frequency slots that are typically for hi-hats, but you could load them up with other things. You can put shakers in here instead or tambourines or whatever. And then they have these two slots where they're like, put in any kind of extra thing you want, right? In this case, I've loaded them up with shaker style sounds, but um, could be anything you want. Could be wild sounds or bleeps or bloops or alarms or whatever, little vocal chants or outbursts, anything you think is useful to the uh, basic drum thing. So nothing exciting so far. Now we're gonna get into the really fun stuff. Um, I'm going to show you the cool thing about this is you can run it independently of any MIDI that's on your track already, independently of your transport by using this play button here, I take it totally away from the host. And I'm gonna turn off host sync so that as I load different sample, uh, different patterns, if you will, they all are um, operating at different tempos. So let's show you this one. This is kind of, these are my user patterns as opposed to the XLN patterns. Um, and if I play this one, you're gonna see how they seamlessly rotate around and kind of loop around, almost like the clip launcher in Bitwig or Ableton. So I've got four different patterns here that I would actually string together in different clips on in my arrangement. There's kind of an intro broken beat style thing, and then it's gonna flip into a more standard mid-tempo house, tech house kind of uh, steady beat groove that's sparse, and then there's a kind of an energetic two variants of it that you know have the hi-hats and shakers going on, and I've got four different patterns there, so it's broken into a, the two bar AB pattern and then the two bar CD pattern. Uh, so just to show you how you can scroll through here and like find what you want and preview things. I'll let this run on for four bars. And now here's just a basic empty open drop type, simple mid-tempo housey kind of beat. And then we're gonna switch into, later in the song, I might have a more high energy drop that would have extra things added to it. So here we go. See how seamlessly it switches? Now let's do a different one. Those two sound the same, but there's actually a difference in the kicks. And now we'll go to a more energetic version. Okay, so <laughs> by the way, if you're a Rez fan, you'll probably notice this drum beat as being pretty much exactly from one of her songs. I just kind of did that as an exercise. Um, anyway, so the cool thing about this browser, unlike pretty much anything else I've ever seen anywhere else, is you can you can preview your your patterns on the fly. You can preview them at the tempo you created them at. You know, by playing them internally inside of XO independently of your DAW transport and independently of your DAW uh, host tempo. So it's a way to go through and hear what, you know, if you've got 50 of these things or 100 of these things, you're just like, okay, what tempo should this be at again? What did I design this for? And it's just right there. All the details you need, even a little pictorial thing showing you uh, at least the A section of each drum set, right? So as I click through here, you're seeing this is this is very sparse. This is obviously energetic with some high energy stuff in it and so on. So it's a really good browser. Um, you can show only the XLN stuff, only your stuff, all of your stuff combined, and you can even use the dice to just 
you know, if you've got hundreds of patterns in here and you just want some inspiration, you just click the dice and it's just gonna pick one for you, right? Okay, let's try it out. Let's try a different one. Okay, that's pretty crunchy. Let's try a different one. Okay, so I'm not gonna dwell on that too much because other videos have covered that, but the point is you need inspiration. You're just not sure where to start. You're just doing an exercise for the day, uh, like some of us do. You know, just pick a random beat and go, make something out of it. Um, back to this stuff though, let's go and load this one up. So if you select the one you want, it's interesting, you can't double click or anything. You always use this green check mark to load it up and get to the good stuff that's inside it, see how it's set up. Uh, it's only a 16-beat grid. You don't have a 32-beat grid. You don't have a triplet grid. Um, I've put in some feature requests for a triplet grid and even a 32, um, 32, 32nd note grid, if you will, instead of a 16th note grid. But right now it's a 16th note grid, which is the most common. Uh, and I'll explain a little later how you can start with a pattern in a 16th note grid and go modify it to be a 30 second note grid in a MIDI clip. Um, like this thing here is actually a little bit better as a 30 second note pattern that I made a 30 second note version of. So let's do this up here. So if we look at this pattern briefly, you can see that uh, you know, it's currently at a 16th note resolution right now, but you can see I have a lot of 30 second notes in here. And if I zoom in on this section, you know, you can see this is happening in the first half of a 16th note. This is happening in the second half. So it's like it's 30 second beat grid pattern, which you can't directly reproduce inside of Atlas. And that is a small drawback if you like to do really techy 30 second beat things. Like here's, here's what it sounds like in Atlas. Um, I'm sorry, I keep saying Atlas. Oh, I'm so sorry, because I'm so used to talking about Atlas. Here's what it sounds like inside of EXO using a 16th beat pattern um, that I, I, I cobbled up to sound kind of like the real 30 second note pattern that I originally did. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to solo these shakers. So you can see wherever these little double dots appear, it's doing double hits. So it is actually creating a 30 second note, two 30 second notes in a row right here. By the way, you can do three 16th, no, 30 second note triplet rolls or 64th rolls or 30 second rolls or no roll, just a 16th note. So that's how this works is you click the little dots to set your rolls. So this sounds pretty good, right? But now I'm gonna run it from the MIDI clip instead. And as I showed you, the MIDI clip is actually set up with a much more interesting spacing of the 30 second notes. And so this is what it sounds like from the MIDI. It's a lot more techy. Play it again from here. See how I tried to capture the feel, but it's not really this. So you know, you could start with a reasonable facsimile built on a 16th note grid, just, you know, throw in some odd double hits here and there to give you the right feel and mess with your swing a little bit. Um, but you can always take this clip and export it. Let's uh, export it over here. You know, I could take this, this clip 
can drop it in. And then you could come in here and start taking the original hits that are happening and you know from XO and then just duplicate and copy and make your 30 second note patterns that way. So that's how I made this one, which has uh, more obvious 30 second note patterns, right? So that's just a little little thing to remember is it's a 16th note grid only right now, but you can get some 30 seconds, some 30 second triplets and some 64th notes with these little dots. But if you really need to do a fast techie kind of uh, uh, pattern, you're gonna have to do some manual editing uh, over in your MIDI clip to do that. But you can start with a 16th note output from XO. Okay, so next thing, that I want to talk about is the browsing. We're gonna we're gonna stop looking at the editing for a minute. I just want to really point out this amazing browser. This is this is the most amazing browser. I currently have. If you look down here, let me turn on the filter. I currently have nearly sixty thousand samples right down here, and they're all represented by this. Currently, I've got this one setting called drumminess turned up just slightly, like about 10%. Um, and what that's doing is it's is it it knows the timbre and content of all these samples. And you see this little darker section down here. If I were to take this and drag it out to zero, you're going to see these all light up all of a sudden, right? So now I'm not hiding any samples. And these samples down here are kind of um, percussion and FX samples that are long sounding and deep sounding. So let's try a few. Hmm. Right, so I've had a few one shots that I pulled in here that are kind of useful in a native instruments, machine style kind of context where you have just some weird non-drum sound as, uh, that pops in every now and then as part of the drum pattern. So that's what these are. And they're all low and sustained. And so they're down in this lower middle part of the map. But this drumminess slider is really, really useful because what it basically says is as you start moving the slider up, it's going to hide those long drawn out things that don't really sound like drum hits. See how a lot of these went dark now? And there were some up here that went dark too. So now if I click around in this area, it'll ignore the dark ones and it's gonna find ones that have a slightly more transient and shorter feel, more like a real drum hit, right? Short, short, impactful, impactful. Okay, that's like a reverse drum. See, these are more, more transient, more impactful. And if I just drag around here. Even though I'm dragging around where there's a lot of FX, you know, not really pure drum hits, but more FX hits, they're still kind of drummy, right? And as I keep dragging this slider up, like, let's take it all the way up to 90%. It's going to throw away everything that isn't really a drum sample or or really really drum like. See, like even though that's not a drum sample, it's very transient. Oh, that's cool, right? So there's a few things that just sound, you know. They have the timbral shape of a, of a reverse drum hit or a regular drum hit, and they're not as tonal usually, right? Weird glitchy stuff that I made. Okay, so that's what this is about. And if you crank this all the way up, like, I only want to see the drum. See, I see it's going to hide everything, so you can just, like, let's do that. Now it's probably all straight drum hits. Okay, so that's what this is about. And this is really useful. I haven't seen too many other videos go into this. So I really wanted to point that out. I, you know, out of these 60,000 samples that I have, I've now filtered it down to about 25,000. I've cut it in half. And there's, these are all really drumming. Okay. 
Um, so that's what this is about. Let me put this back down where I usually keep it, which is around there. And uh, the other thing you can do is hide longer sounds. So like those long reverse samples and whatever. If I drag this up, it's gonna filter out a bunch more. And now these are all gonna be shorter sounds. Right? Uh, so that's a good way to filter what you've got in the browser. And then you can also filter by frequency. Like, okay, is it, let's see everything in the full frequency range, but let's say you really wanna just see things that happen way up in the, let's get right up to almost 10K. Yeah, greater than 7K. So what have we got that's really interesting, crispy, high frequency, really almost above the range of what's tonal? Okay. Nice stuff, right? Um, and you'll notice that as you drag around, it'll just snap to the closest thing. So it makes it easy to, even when you've got it heavily filtered like this, it makes it very easy to just quickly demo uh, what's available to you. Now if I drag this out a little bit, we're just gonna be in the, you know, symbol land for the most part, closed hi-hats. Green is open hi-hats mostly. Orange are sort of like shakers and tambourines. Those kind of things. And uh, these are symbols. Okay. So another thing you're probably noticing by now is that this map makes a whole lot of sense to the brain. The minute you, the minute you play with this a little bit, you start going, oh, that's what's going on. So let's focus on the perks for a minute, right? Um, what their algorithm has identified as perk samples, you can see it's broken it into three main clusters. There's this cluster down here, there's a cluster over here on the right, and there's this big cluster above, and then there's all this stuff that's intermingled with the other colors, like, you know, the blue of the snare or the pink of the um, claps, right? There's a lot of orange interspersed in here too. So what's going on with that? This whole map kind of goes spectral, lower sub bass frequencies down here through the higher, you know, 4K range, 5K range, 7K range, and so on on this side. So this is almost like reflecting a uh, spectrum analyzer straight across. Then from bottom to top, it kind of goes by sustain and length and pitch. So down here is going to be longer and lower pitch. Up here is going to be shorter and higher pitch. So with regard to these perks, for example, see they're kind of in the lower mid-range, the dominant wow. frequencies. But up here, Right? And then over on this side, because this is represents the high frequencies, you know, 3K, 4K, 5K, 7K, we're gonna hear the sizzly things, the things that fill up your high end. So I would expect to hear shakers and tambourines and sounds like shakers and tambourines up here when I click these orange ones, right? See how they're all shaker-like and they have that sizzle for the high end. So the minute you, you just explore a little bit, you go, oh, if I want something deep and low, I'm gonna be down in, in this side and this end of things, this quadrant. If I want something that's higher frequency, but still kind of mid-range in pitch or low in pitch, I'm gonna be looking around here. If I want something higher in pitch and high frequency, I'm gonna be looking around here in this quadrant and, and so on. So. Uh, for any given sound like the snares, we know that the deeper, darker snares are gonna be along here. And we know that the brighter, snappier snares are gonna be along here, right? So. As opposed to. And 
and see how they get even brighter and more high frequency over here. It's like this is pitch versus right? And this is more sizzle frequency content versus not much high frequency content on this side. Okay, so that pattern holds true for every sound of every type. Same with the kicks. If we go over here and, and toggle on the kicks. Very dry, very, very dark. Long 808s. 808s and thumps and, and ring outs are happening down here. Right, but up here we have higher pitched, more transient kicks. And as you move over to this side, they have a little more high frequency content. Versus really dry, dead, only low frequency content on this side. Oops, <laughs> got rid of a thing there. Uh, and so on. So really, really versatile, strong filtering. You can also filter by your uh, sample folders. Let's let's open up all the drums again. Let's. Um, so I've got sixty thousand samples. About fifty-two thousand of them are showing. But now I can say, well, I want to look for a specific genre because I I brought these in and organized them by genre. So let me just hear only my my. Let's turn off this one. This one. This is a little tedious. I put in a feature request to have a a toggle button that'll turn them all off in one go. But let's just turn off the, some of these things. I don't filter this way too often. So, you know, let's say I just want my grime and uh, well, just my grime drums. What the hell, right? Turn all those off. Okay, these are the drums that I would have classified as grime in my own manual curation. You know, all fairly aggressive, a little sound effects down here. Nice and grimy. Kind of their rim shot type sounds, hi-hats. Really sharp, really loud, really saturated, and so on. So if you are careful where I'm going with this is if you're careful when you bring in your um, sample folders, if you do it in a methodical way, it's kind of rechecking everything to see if there was anything to update. Uh, you can see that I made a custom kind of EXO content folder in my documents folder. I made a custom set of all my one shots that I wanted to bring in here. And I grouped them by, to me, important categories, like all my 808s are in one folder everything I considered kind of perk or Foley type sounds and more acoustic organic sounds, I put in another folder, uh, all my special mid-tempo, crazy industrial, highly processed drum sounds that I made myself, I put in a folder called Baffy Witch. Um, Chiptune stuff is in another folder, Jungle Neuro DMB stuff's in another folder, Dubstep Rhythm mid-tempo's in another folder, and so on. So. I made these folder categories that to me were important. Like if, if I want to hear only the stuff that's available to me in battery or machine um, um, expansions and so on. I'm sorry, the factory library. These are the, the machine factory library and the battery factory library, both of which are huge. Uh, I pulled them in, they're here. Every, every tasty thing in these two libraries is here. But if I want to filter everything else out and just look at these, I can do that because I set up my folders this way when I brought them in. So this is something to think about if you're going to experiment with this. Don't just take your huge sample library with tons and tons of folders and just drop it in as one folder. Or don't drag in 70 different folders because if you do that, you're going to uh, 
be a little slowed down when you get to this filtering dialog because right now it's hard to turn them on and off in, a, in one group. Uh, you have to do it one at a time, so I think it's worth uh, doing a little pre-curation pre and set up a folder before you bring things in. My total set of samples that I brought in worked out to about 20 gigabytes uh, of just pure one-shots. There's no other junk in there. There's no loops. It's just all one shots. Um, so that's kind of all the tricks about the filtering dialog. And it is super useful. Uh, let's see what else is useful to talk about. Everyone's talked about this similarity thing to death, but let's let's load something up and uh, let me reload this actually. Just get my kickback that was in there. Okay, so this is this is really mind blowing to me. In other tools like ADSR Sample Manager or Algonauts um, Atlas, you have a random sample button. You have a dice button, and it'll just say, "Well, let me completely replace your entire kit with completely random samples, right?" Or pick one drum sound or one slot at a time and just replace that one, like you know, lock lock some of these down, um, and, you know, you can lock a certain sample row with these little lock buttons right here, right, and don't randomize those. So the way you would work in something like Atlas is you would just let it randomize the entire kit and you would play it, and then you would say, well, I, I really like that snare, but I don't like anything else. So you would come over here and lock that snare track and then you would roll the dice again and completely reshuffle everything else except that snare. And you would just keep rolling the dice and locking down tracks as uh, specific sounds as they started being close to what you wanted. And then eventually you end up with a kit that you found with a lot of happy accident sounds. You might not have found any other way if you were browsing, but you know, you, you slowly build up a kit by rolling and locking, rolling and locking. EXO works kind of different, and it works different in a way that makes a whole lot of sense. This is this is the big aha moment for me with, with XO. All of XO's randomization is what I would call a random but highly similar kind of randomization. It doesn't just, it doesn't just go out here to the space. All right, what am I doing wrong? Uh, it doesn't just go out here to the space map and just completely re-roll the currently selected drums. Instead, it always pulls from other nearby drums to each one of these little clusters. So like, this is my kick here, right? This is the other kick, these two red dots right here. This is my snare. This is my clap up here. So let's say I wanted a replacement for this snare. If I start walking through this list of randomly you know, other random samples, and I can do it either with these arrow keys or by manually clicking, or I can just use the left and right arrow keys on my keyboard, which is what I'm gonna do. Watch what happens up here. It's a very nearby snare. So it's kind of the same general area of frequency and pitch and length, right? It's not, it's not grabbing a snare from way over here. It's not grabbing a snare from way over here in this little cluster, right? It's staying close to home. So watch, watch again as I go through this whole list. It's staying close to home. It's randomizing, but in a way that is still clustered around the essential character of the sound you currently have loaded, right? And if I do this re-roll thing right here, and let me zoom in a little bit so you can see what this is gonna do. So I'm exposing a lot more dots. The more I zoom in, the more you can see how many snares are really hiding around there. Let me right click and drag this up to the center of the screen. All right, so this is the re-roll button for this one snare. If I do this, it's gonna pull out a new set of alternatives. This is still the same exact original snare right here, but as I pop around through here, you're going to see it pick different alternatives.
Remember that pattern. I'm gonna re-roll it again. See how it's a different set of random options this time? I'm gonna do it again. Okay, and actually I'm gonna go back. Uh, um, um. Yeah, I wanted it back to you. Nope, all right. Huh. Operator error, let's do a thing. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm trying to remember what my shortcut keys do. Now I'm off in La La Land. Let's just reload this again one more time. There's a way to undo that and avoid popping off in the weeds that I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so we're back here in our original snare right here. Oh, notice how it jumps if you're zoomed in. Very helpful. Uh, so again, walking through the randoms. Now I'm going to re-roll again. See how it's staying the same if I start with a certain snare, right? Rerolling again. Okay, so what this points out is that from a, a starting point, it's going to pick a set that are kind of randomly around it, that are close to it. Now, the way you start deviating and zeroing in on the real sound you want is by picking one of these other sounds that are a little closer to what you want and then randomizing on that. So the idea here is like, let's say you're dragging around in the tree. I'm gonna go ahead and replace the snare entirely by clicking it and now I'm in this mode where anything I pick is the new snare in this first slot. So let's start with that one. And I click this and now that's the new snare. And the set of available options. And I go, oh, no, wait, that's closer to what I want. That one right there. Hmm, I like that. And so if I click it with my mouse here, it suddenly becomes the new snare. Or, uh, I don't think I can go back at this point, so let's keep exploring. Yeah, that's what I want. I want that pitch, but a little more ringy, right? So now I'm, I'm here, and if I randomize with this button, it's gonna jump, see how it, it even shows you? I'm gonna move this one to be the current main one. It's gonna move it over with that arrow. So if I do this, it's now rooted on here, but it's gonna start cycling around with different random close by things. Ah, okay, so then I can compare these two. And I go, you know what, this is the one I want. And so you, you, you use it to help you slowly iterate and narrow in on the exact sound you want from some starting thing you found just by dragging your, your mouse around, right? And once you find the one you want, you just come over to this slot and click it. And now this is locked in as the snare sample. Again, another way you can do it if you don't wanna get quite that fancy is you can click the button and just manually find things and everything you find, it's gonna just automatically sort of like replace in that slot. But if I click this, it'll go back to the original. Oh, I went to, that's what I meant to do. So if I click this one, And you can hear it in context while you're playing.
Okay. Like, let's say I like that one. Then I just click the green button and now it's locked in as the new snare. So I hope you're getting the idea that this is a really good way to explore and find sounds you want. If I want a dark, heavy snare, I'm gonna look around here. If I want a brighter, snappier, poppier snare. And if I'm getting too many other colors. You know, I could easily swap that out like I found this one and I can come over here and just click this button and now suddenly that's my new snare. Let's turn it up. Okay, so that's cool for manual browsing, manual filtering. I've explained how this doesn't work like the kind of randomization you're used to. But there's a whole other way to do it that's very cool, which is to use the sample combiner. Uh, and I'm gonna go back and let's uh, reload this from scratch again. All right, so we're back to the original. Now, here's another awesome way to do it. It's already got these pre-designed pre kind of, um, uh, space kits. How do we get to it? There's a different way to get to it. That's all. Is it you? No, it's not you. Is it you? Is it you? Where are you hiding? There's another view of these that shows them all at once. Where is that view hiding? I don't actually use that view very much, but I've run across it before. Well, there is another view that shows you a bunch of circles. I think it's maybe here, here, no, here. No, where are you hiding? Is it you? No, no, no. Okay, well, I can't show you that. But there is, uh, you can use these arrows to jump around through these different kits, like I'm about to show you here, or you can use these hands, or you can use the random button, or you can use this button. So watch what happens as I play this basic groove. Now, what I want you to take away from this is they all make sense. They're all similar variations of the original sound right here, right? They're not halfway across the map in a completely different timbre and a completely different type of sound. So all of these variations are subtle, fairly subtle variations compared to what a tool like Atlas will do, okay? And the random button does a slightly different thing. It's gonna just, pick from these similar sounds, but in different combinations and straight up and down. Oh, I like that one. Okay. And if you find one you like, you just click this and now that's your new kit over here. Let's go back and play with this some more. The other way you can use this is this one button right here. Okay, so again, it's the same concept as what I showed you for a single sound. If I click this randomization button, it's gonna take every single sample that's currently in the kit, and it's gonna move it over into the starting position and make it like the new default sample for this kit. Like right now we're in a variation, we're in this random variation, and if we wanted to get back to the original, we would just click this. But let's say I wanted to like keep refining the sound of my kit to something more like this combination of sounds. It's a 
lot tighter. It's a lot brighter than what I had originally. So if I click this, that becomes the new main set. And now these are all a different set of alternatives. So I can start walking through again. See how overall this new set based off of what I found a few minutes ago is a, is all of these options are brighter and poppier and filling up the high end of the spectrum some more. And I can roll the dice and come up with other combinations. God, some of these are great. So you see how I've, I've slowly warped this original kit into a whole different, brighter sound, and I've got all these myriad combinations that are all in that same general frequency spectrum. You know, that's that same spectral balance. This is insane. I'm sorry, Atlas was great, but Atlas could not work in this intelligent way that keeps you in this random yet highly similar kind of exploration. And so this is just... None of the other videos I've seen have really explained what's going on here, but it's fantastic. It's like you can come up with eight or ten different variations of your beat to spread out across your arrangement. So your drum, you, you know, your backing drums can really sound fundamentally different from section to section and yet similar enough that they don't sound disconnected, even though they're using very different drum sounds. And you can do it for the entire kit, or you you know these little things here will just do that kind of replacement for a couple sounds. And you can, you know, come through here, find a new variation, and then you know without even necessarily locking it in or changing anything, you can click the export dialog, and you can you can say render the waves, and now these very specific sounds I've selected, we're going to pull them out and drop them in as a wave here. Let me get rid of a bunch of tracks just to make some room on my screen. This is all my template groups. Okay, so this particular combination I have right now, this nice poppy combination I like, I can render the whole thing as a wave and I can drag it out and pull it in uh, right here, okay? Now I can pick a different combination and we'll render again. And now I'm gonna pull that beat out as a wave. And it's the two different combinations, but I haven't messed up my original kind of root starting position. Let me go back to my root sounds that I, I started with to really like. You can see how the dialogue, the export dialogue clears itself out again. I can render the waves one more time and pull this one out. All right, now we're just gonna go audition all three of those. Let me close this down for a minute. And we'll solo this one. And now we'll solo this one. Now we'll solo this one. Okay, so it's faithful. It's 100% faithful to exactly what we were doing uh, in EXO itself, and yet I haven't had to save anything or change my main root starting point. I could just sit here all day and just pick different combinations and re-render them and bring them out. And you could have all these, you know, this is like doing a mud pie for bass sounds or something, right? Where you just do a lot of crazy processing on the fly and record it all in real time and then chop out really interesting bits to make you know, your bass chop groove out of for your drops. Similar kind of thing. You could just sit here all day and randomize and re-swizzle kits and drag the, the rendered samples out and then start chopping and rearranging these samples to make any kind of custom thing you want. And you're going to come across so many happy accidents this way that you would have never found another way. Like, you know, you take this section here and slice it. All right, take the same section here and slice it. And then uh, let's just uh, mute that one and mute these two. 
And I'm all solo both of these. And now I have a custom thing that's like mangling together two very different kits, but they're not that different. So it's gonna sound okay. Wait, let's start it from the beginning. Right? That didn't sound too left field. That didn't sound like it didn't belong. It still had the same spectral characteristics, even though it was a different role and different sounds. And I mean, think about this. This is amazing for us, you know, electronic music producers and bass music producers. You can really spice up your drum kits with this basic, basic, simple workflow, right? And again, I haven't, I haven't locked myself into anything. I still have these original drums that I that I, I had. I actually need to unsolo these now. Uh, and let's just mute them all. All right, so I'm back to what this is playing. Actually, there's what's actually going on here. Okay, so great, great workflow for sample combinations. And I hope you understand what all these things do now. This live filter basically says, okay, while you're playing this, let's play it again. I'm going to then start changing things like drumminess and watch what happens over here. Okay, let's get it playing. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is this is a little tricky. See what it did when I turned on the filter? It said, okay, I'm going to apply this filter and give you a secondary alternative right here. I haven't changed your original sounds that you last locked into the kit, right? This is a new set of sounds based on your current filters. Now, if I keep changing things here, it's going to keep doing it in the second row. Watch what happens. Is that fantastic or what? I could start turning off certain drum kits that I don't want to be considered for these and it's just on the fly. That's why it's called a live filter. On the fly with your filtering, it's just coming up with new combinations for you. And then every one of these additional ones is in the same general alternative vein as what the filter has. Now, this is another fun thing. As I started moving the frequency range up so high that kick drums were no longer even in this set anymore, it started replacing my kick drums with snare drums right on the fly, but it picked the lowest pitched ones it could find. Okay, so really powerful feature. Is it, is it totally useful? You, you decide, experiment. All right, enough about that. This is so freaking powerful. This is amazing. This is like discovery, happy accidents on steroids. I've never seen anything like this. So it's just amazing. So let's just undo everything I've done so far. Go back to the original. Uh, what else is useful here? So yeah, this may seem self-explanatory, uh, there's a couple things I want to point out here, though, that are pretty cool. So this is the sounds of your samples. You can, of course, go in and adjust things like, you know, this kind of shape may not be good. If you want your drums to be punchy, you might want to uh, 
start it later, finish it sooner, add a fade in or fade out to it, that kind of thing. So this is just your standard kind of editor for that. Um, pan is self-explanatory. This one's cool though. So here's a hi-hat. Let's solo it, play the pattern. Oh, I don't have any hi-hats in this one. Let's go pick one that has hi-hats. It's a little sparse, but you'll get the idea. Here, let me just uh, stop it for a second, just fill this up. Let's do this, and let's just put in a busier pattern like that. I'll talk about this in a minute. <laughs> Okay, so a big problem with hi-hats is a lot of times they're too ticky-tacky-clacky, like typewriter keys. They're just nasty in a mix. Usually you want, if you're going to use a hi-hat at all, you typically want to take away that transient and make it fatter and fuzzier like you hear here. Let me turn it up a little more. So here it was originally. A lot more ticky-tacky, right? So what I'm trying to show you here is this, this envelope curve is very different than an ADSR curve. The first bar is transient. Take away all the transient. Make it hyper transient. And it's really musical, it's really well done. Right? So you can make really simple transient changes with this filter thing. Uh, and I've done that for especially the hats and cymbals and some other sounds. Now the next thing you can play with here that's cool is the total decay time. Like you can shorten or lengthen the sample. This is the full length of the sample. But I can start shortening it up. You could do the same thing with a kick. Uh, here, yeah, let's shorten the kick up. All right, so up at the top is full length of the sample, and then this is starting to shorten that end time a little bit. Let's play with the transient. See this this transient control is really musical. Let's check the snare. Look at that bite. That snare is biting like crazy. But it's not distorted or weird. It works. Now I'll make the snare a lot mushier, take away the transient on it. So where I'm going with this is this transient control is fantastic. I, I just think it's awesome. And then the hold is how long you hold the original part of the, of the body at, at full volume before you start decaying. And that's all that's about. Um, pitch and tone. The tone is interesting. It's like a tilt EQ and it doesn't, it leaves the center alone and only kind of shelves up the highs or shelves up the lows and, and does them in an opposite and equal way. So again, with the snare, let's put it this way. If I just let you hear the snare, let's turn it up a little bit. Sorry, too bad. Okay, pretty useful. Um, then we have the filter control, which is great for, you know, pulling out low end you don't want, or in the case of these hi-hats, 
Some of these hi-hats are pretty fat. See, I don't want all that in my mix. I don't want all that low end. But pull it up to about here, and it's filling up the part of the spectrum I want, right? So really good tone controls, velocity. Now, this part over here is interesting. Your routing, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but if you watched my last video, well, not my last video, number 20, where I talked about how to do set up Bitwig for really fast audio flattening of any kind of VST that has multiple outs. You can go watch this uh, if you want, but that's what I've got going on here with my EXO kit. Here's EXO itself that I've been playing for you. My bus channels, my bus outputs from EXO are muted at the moment, but if I wanted to, I could unmute these, mute the master, and then take whatever pattern I'm playing and just in one go record it all out into their own audio tracks with each individual sound. Um, so, you know, any kind of multi-out VST has some way of routing its individual multi-outs for each of its ch internal channels. So this is something I've never seen before. One of the routing options is to route a given sound like the kick to both an external channel and also to the master. So the kick would be on this channel and on the master. And that's actually really useful in a lot of ways. I wish other programs had had this option for me. So if we just watch down here, watch what happens when I play from here. And let's solo you and just solo the kick. So see how the kick is right here in bus one, but because it's muted, you're not hearing it. But Now we're hearing it through bus one. And these tracks are just set up to listen to these buses and just, you know, record the output all at the same time in one go. So that's useful. And, and why it's useful is early on, I don't care about all this bus crap. I only use this maybe during detailing and, and final mix down when I want super tight control over every single sound and heavy processing on certain sounds and stuff like that. But early on, I don't want to mess with any of that or think about any of that. So by having the whole kit just go to the one single master channel, things are a lot easier for me at first when I'm just doing my rough sound designing and pattern building. Uh, but it's nice to have that option to set all these up to also go to each bus as well as the master. Then you have your reverses, you have uh, a poly mode. This is kind of like a choke, but it's a self choke basically. So if, if this were on and I had a long kick that rang out, it would let both of the kick hits that were close together ring out on top of each other, but this would self choke so that as soon as the next kick hit, it would cut off the tail of the previous kick. And then over here, this one is your mute groups. So this is how you make choke groups between You've got four different choke groups, so you can make, you know, put several different things on group one and then they would choke each other. So that's what that's about. Uh, and then these are sends to the FX thing. This is basically a bunch of reverbs, reverb types. Uh, this is a bunch of uh, delay types and, and some reverb. You can, you can have two reverbs or two delays on here. These are actually very musical, very subtle. Uh, this thing on the master bus, this is what I like about the master bus. This crunch thing is like Ableton's drum bus built into this. You've got a bunch of different saturation modes. You've got a way to filter the EQ of the overall master output. You can do some uh, simple cuts or harder cuts. Um, basically, this is a soft uh, 12 dB slope, really gentle dB slope on this filter, or I could make it more resonant to emphasize something by moving this filter point. And then of course it's got some soft clipping. And if, if you're doing any actual clipping on the master, this little bullseye thing will light up. And the more clipping you do, the, the more rings will light up. So I'm not driving anything hard enough to clip at the moment, but check out this, this thing is really cool and you can automate it too. Uh, so you can do some fun stuff with this. So Let's say I wanted more oomph to this than it already has. Oh, that 
that oh, sharp hi hat's gonna drive me crazy. Let me reload the original sound. Okay, really clean bass emphasis. That's what this one does. It's not messing with uh, the highs too much. Another mode. Let's say I want to do some really sharp drums. A little kind of hard style kind of sharpness to it. All right? Uh, the degrade settings are really nice. Well, transform is just a really nice subtle saturation. You can overdo it with that one, but. At low values, it's very, very musical. Um, then this one's cool. Right, imagine automating that. That's the bit one. And then here's a different type of destruction. Sorry for my doggy. Okay, so some pretty tasty, uh, tasty drum bus style saturation effects. Now, you'll lose this if you use the individual bus outs, but it's still, it's a good way to play with an idea and get a feel for what might work in the context of the song. And then if you need to, you can reproduce that same type of thing with other processing plugins uh, if you flatten everything out to individual tracks and actually use the bus outs. Uh, another nice part about having something go to the bus at the same time it goes to the master is I've run into problems before with sidechain. Uh, to show you this, I have to reload a new template. So let's just go pop open a new template. So in EXO, take a sec to load, because it's loading that huge space map into memory. Okay, so it's set up to output signal to all the bus channels as well as the master. So if I'm playing XO, there's the kick, there's the snare. And they're triggering on these bus channels even though they're muted, but what I'm hearing is through the master. So I can take advantage of this master section stuff and these master FX sends and so on. But because on these buses, I have a signal generator that Bitwig calls replacer, that's basically listening to the kick and then generating a MIDI note 60, which is like middle C or C3 or something, just below C3, I can't remember off the top of my head. And I've got it filtered pretty hard. So watch what happens here as I play the pattern. See this yellow light? Every time that yellow light blinks, it's generating a short MIDI note. And I'm doing the same thing over here on the snare bus. So here's the, the one that's on the snare bus. And this little thing happening, even though these tracks are muted, the replacers are still hearing the signal, right? Because it's the muting is post insert. So I'm generating a special MIDI note from my snare hit. I'm generating a special MIDI note from my main kick hit. And then over on my sub bus, um, let's close you down for a minute. Over here on my sub bus, I have a Ducker device set up. 
that uh, is basically listening to that replacer device that's on that one bus channel for the kick. And then it's, it's saying, I'm picking up the MIDI note that's coming in there and I'm sending it to Gatekeeper. So now Gatekeeper can be used for ducking my kick. Now remember, it's a steady beat, so I have a kick on every quarter note. That's why you're seeing the kick trigger every time. And then over here on my snare, I've got the same thing where this is listening to the replacer on bus track three, and it's listening for that MIDI note. And so every time the snare hits, you're gonna see this longer. <coughs> hey, stop that. You're gonna see this longer thing. So if I, if, if, EXO didn't have this special routing option that would send to both the bus and the master, I couldn't do this. I couldn't have adva the, the advantage of these kind of built-in master effects that sound really good and also be automatically tr generating uh, sidechain trigger symbol signals. <laughs> for my duckers on various tracks. Like I've got duckers on my subgroup, I've got duckers on my drop sound group, and they're all listening uh, or able to listen to sidechain triggers from lots of different places around the, the project. So this is great. This is, I wish other programs had had this. Uh, what else is worth looking at? Okay, the accentuator is really cool. Let's, uh, Reload this, make sure I've got everything back to default. So if you look carefully here, you can see I've got the accentuator button selected and three of these little things are more lit up than the other ones. So that what this means is this particular hi-hat track is listening to the accentuator. So is this one and so is this one. Let's go find something that's using these. Okay, so this is gonna be hit with the accentuator and so is this hi-hat. And so what the accentuator is doing is you're saying, do automatic velocity changes for me, okay? And so if we solo the tracks that are using it and we play this pattern, turn it up for you a little bit. Now I'm going to turn the accentuator off and listen to how it changes. Let me turn the swing off too, just so you can really hear the difference. So it's subtle in this particular thing because I didn't, you know, you don't want to do overdo things like this. But what it's doing is every eighth note, it's increasing the velocity and then the other one is decreased. So this hit, for example, is a lower velocity than this hit. This hits lower velocity than this hit and so on. So if I were to export this MIDI, let's do export and let's drag out the MIDI. Just take a look at it real quick. And let's turn on the velocity indicator. You can see that uh, every other eighth note has this low velocity, right? But if I turn off the accentuator and we drag this out again, There I go. We look at this one. You can see now the velocity is more uh, even and it's other things that are causing these notes to be lower velocity. It has to do with the volume that they're set at. These volume controls are essentially kind of sort of uh, velocity in a way. You can, you can set velocity over here so if you drag, for example, this thing down and it starts becoming dull in the center, like you see right here, 
that means less velocity, that means more velocity. So it's just when I set up these grooves, some of them already have a little less velocity than others, like these two. Uh, but this accentuator feature is a way to, you know, have a more automated, and you can combine it at different note intervals and uh, let the whole, all of these tracks use it or just certain sounds use it. It's just very helpful for adding some variation. And then of course you have the swing stuff too, um, which lets you set individual swing types or swing values for every track individually, or you can just, these ones that are gray are gonna pick up whatever I do here at the global swing, right? So you can globally swing. So super obvious and intuitive and musical and useful. You know, the pan is right there, the transient's right there, the, the length of the thing is right there, pitch and tone right there, a filter right there. Routing is awesome. You can reverse, uh, you, can, you can tell any given track to just play its samples reversed with this button. You got two different FX sends. This crunchy thing, this accentuator, your groove, it's just fantastic. And then finally, uh, I won't talk too much about this. It's, you can play with it. I, I prefer to hand draw a lot of my stuff, but I could see how you could get some happy accidents this way too. So let's go back to sort of where we started. Let's play this combination. I'll just show you briefly what this does. Make sure you're hearing everything. Okay, so if you're stuck for ideas and you're you're not being really genre specific, I guess you could use this, but my problem with this is these are all more traditional, funky and poppy and rocky and non-electronic drum hits by default. I mean, it's a nice little laboratory, but I wish I could make my own patterns here. Maybe someday they'll give us the ability to make our own patterns to, to live here. Uh, but for now, since I do a lot of dance genres that play by different rules than this stuff, I don't find too much use in this particular beat combiner. But if you weren't a, a dance music producer, you might think this was the most awesome thing in the world. Uh, and of course, for any one line, you know, I could go back to all the originals that were in my, you know, this is the beat that I made up. Uh, you could just play with variations of one sound. Like if I wanted to try some different hi-hat patterns, I suppose that would be useful. Okay, so maybe useful. Maybe useful in some contexts. Your mileage may vary, uh, but that's that's what this thing is about. I'm far more interested in this sample combiner. This is this is where the meat is. So anyway, that's a uh, kind of. I still wish I could figure. Out. Oh, right click. To, right click. Is that how I get to that? Let's find out. Do I right click it? No. Left click it. See, there's a way to jump through your different kits in the same way as this thing does. Right, as I click through here, it's just doing the same thing as clicking those hands. So you may or may not find this very useful. I prefer to just work in this mode directly. Uh, but that's about all I have to say about this. I think it's fantastic. I think if uh, you're looking for a way to speed up your beat production workflow, uh, you far worse than this, especially since its export options are just amazing. Oh, there is one more thing that's actually worth talking about. When you render the waves for a beat, you can have it render at exactly the volume that you've been playing it, or you can normalize it, but it's got an interesting normalize option. What this one does is it normalizes the entire kit right up to zero dB, or very close to zero dB. 
but it keeps everything relative to each other. So this takes the whole signal and makes it louder, but relatively the same. So it sounds the same. It's just the whole drum kit's a little louder. So let's briefly look at this real quick. Uh, let me get rid of a bunch of tracks again, just to make more room on the screen. Not you. Okay, so this is pretty cool. So here is the whole kit rendered out at its current volume. Now I'm gonna do normalize to relative, render waves again, drag this one out, and you can see the whole thing's a little, slightly bigger, a little bit. See, so you can see the snare is a little different, uh, but it's subtle. And then if you do max, it's gonna basically take every sound, every single sound and normalize it out as loud as it can go, kind of. So yeah, maybe on the whole sample, it's not the same. I, there, there are other kits I had where the difference was a lot more apparent. Oh, it's probably because I made this whole thing louder. Yeah, let's put this back to zero dB and you'll, you'll see the difference a little more drastically. So here's normalized relative again. Yeah, and then let's go back and set this one to no normalization. Yeah, I had turned up the master volume, so that was making the difference. Let's stop. There we go. That's what I expected to see. So here's the volume I'm really playing everything at, but here is if it were normalized as loud as, you know, to fit the whole track at max, but everything's still relatively the same. And then if I do the max, I think we'll see yet another difference. And I guess it looks the same when it's the whole kit. Uh, but if I were bringing out individual sounds, that's like that particular kick drum is normalized to full. But if I go back to uh, relative, it might be a slightly different size. In that case, since the kick is like one of the loudest things in my mix, let's try a, a clap, that'll be different. There's a, I'm sorry, a hi-hat. So there's a hi-hat normalized relative. And here's a hi-hat, the same hi-hat normalized to max. And yeah, you can see it's a little bit fatter and bigger, right? And then here's with no normalization. So you can see how quickly you can get processed sounds, unprocessed sounds. I was pulling out the processed sounds or you can get the raw waves normalized at different levels, depending, it's just fantastic. All right, thanks for hanging with me. Hope this was useful and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.